Hey everybody, Professor Tomney here, back with another lesson, and today we are going to discuss carbon dating. So we're going to discuss what carbon dating actually is, how we can use it to roughly date or approximate the date of objects, and we also want to discuss where its limitations are going to lie. So all of that is coming up on the channel right now. Okay, so if you have ever sat through an organic chemistry class, you would quickly realize that carbon is obviously central and very important, especially to living organisms. So carbon is kind of interwoven into the life cycle. So you start by talking about the uptake of carbon dioxide that would be involved with plant matter, and then plants are going to take that carbon material and produce carbon-based sugars in the form of glucose. So animals are going to eat that plant material, and then animals are eating those animals. So not to get too circle of life type, but you are really talking about how this all connects as far as the carbon going through the life chain. So all, if you look at all of the different uh, macronutrients as far as fats and carbohydrates and uh, um, proteins, amino acids, all of them are going to be carbon-based, and that is essential for living organisms on planet Earth. You need to have carbon. It's kind of the backbone for all of these organic molecules that make up living organisms. So, again, you're talking about primarily a lot of the carbon coming in as CO2 to the plants. The plants are going to make glucose. That glucose can then be consumed right, and ends up in animals. So all along the way, whether you're talking about carbon dating a piece of wood that came from a plant that was taking in CO2, right, if you're talking about uh, something like some sort of a carnivorous animal that was eating another animal that was eating the plants, carbon is tied up uh, and intertwined amongst this chain. And so that's a very important concept. And the reason we kind of started by talking about that is that you have to realize when you talk about carbon dating, the intake of carbon from the environment is part of what allows us to utilize uh, carbon dating. So carbon dating is going to be limited to things that would contain this ratio of carbon content um, that we are looking at on a regular basis. Uh, and when I say a regular basis, obviously a living organism is consistently taking in food, taking in nutrients, participating in this cycle. And so its carbon-14 is going to be replenished or renewed when it is continuously doing that. And once that living organism has died or passed on, it no longer actively uptakes that carbon material and the carbon-14 starts to decay. And when it decays, that's how we can start looking at carbon dating, okay? So there was a lot of terminology in there that we kind of want to separate out. So going back to carbon, if we take a look at carbon, just the basic element, the most common carbon is going to have six protons, and all carbons have to have six protons because protons identify the element or give it its identity. So it's got six protons, and then the most common carbon has six neutrons. So this is commonly referred to as carbon-12. And you'll see it written, you can either see a 12 up there like that, or sometimes you'll just see it written as C-12. And both are referring to carbon-12. Carbon-12 is the most stable and by far the most abundant form of carbon in the known universe. So we're talking about 99% approximately, it's a little bit less than that by most calculations, 98.9 .9, somewhere in there. But about 99% of carbon material that you're going to come across is carbon-12. It is a very stable isotope of carbon. Now remember from your chemistry classes that isotopes are going to be the same element with a differing number of neutrons. So carbon-12 is one of the options. The other one that is fairly well known, especially if you're into the science field, is going to be carbon-13. So this is going to be six protons, but now we will have seven neutrons instead of six. So you add those together and you get C-13. So C-13 is responsible for 
uh, the radioactivity that we see when we do NMR. So for those of you that may have been in an organic chemistry or an instrumental chemistry class and you've talked about NMR, which is kind of similar to MRI imaging techniques, okay, you're utilizing carbon-13 and the carbon-13 that is present is about 1%, roughly. So if it's about 1%, you're talking about 1 in every 100 carbons is going to be a carbon-13. So not a huge count, but certainly enough when you're talking about the magnitude of Avogadro's number and above, right, on the magnitude of roughly 10 to the 23rd, 1 in every 100 is going to net you a decent count um, as far as carbon-13 is concerned, which is exactly why we can do carbon NMR because carbon-13 is abundant enough that you can pick up on it with the signals, okay? Now, one of the others, and uh, carbon can range, I believe it's from 8 up to carbon-22, they found in the University of Tokyo, which is pretty impressive, uh, back in the mid-2000s. So, if you take a look, carbon-14 is the next best-known one, and these three primarily comprise what most people think of when we talk about carbon. Most of the others are lab-made, they're very unstable, they're going to decay within a matter of, you know, milliseconds, nanoseconds, things like that. But carbon-14 is another option. So this is going to have six protons and it's going to have eight neutrons. Okay, and then this one, carbon-14, is most definitely less than 1%. So not a whole lot. And in fact, one of the things that's important here is that carbon-14 and carbon-12 have a predictable ratio to one another. Okay. But carbon-14 is the carbon source that we are utilizing or talking about when we talk about carbon dating something. And that's because carbon-14 is radioactive. Now keep in mind radioactivity, okay, does not always mean, uh, you know, uranium level radioactivity or something that is potentially damaging, okay, this decay, uh, can occur on many different spectrums, okay? Not necessarily always the super high energy one. Um, so when you're talking about the radioactivity decay here, a C14 has a half-life of approximately 5,730 years. Okay? And what that means, okay, that's the half-life. What that means is that if I have some concentration or some amount of C14, after 5,730 years, half of that concentration will be left. And after another 5,730 years, one fourth of the initial concentration will be left or half of a half and one eighth. And then you proceed forward from there as you're moving along. Okay, so one of the other important things here aside from the fact that C14 has a very, very long half-life, is that it also has a predictable ratio, as I said a minute ago, to C12. And as long as a living organism is constantly taking in carbon, this ratio stays fairly consistent, we find, in nature until the organism dies. And the ratio here of C14 to C12 is approximately one to one trillion with a T. Okay, so this is a very large count compared to the one in a hundred for C13, right? So you can see that uh, the C14 is not very common. It's most definitely outnumbered here, okay? This is, if we're talking about uh, orders of magnitude, 10 to the 12th. So that's a pretty impressive gap that you have there. But nonetheless, you are able to utilize techniques that are sensitive enough to pick up on carbon-14, okay, up until about, and this is where we start to run into limitations in this discussion, it's up until about 50,000 years, okay? So if I'm going to carbon date something, I have a span or a ticking timeline of about 50,000 years that I can go back. And once you get past that level, the detectable amount of carbon-14 is going to be subject to error or negligible.
And the problem then becomes if there is that gap there, you don't know whether the carbon-14 that was measurable ran out yesterday, 50 years ago, 1,000, right? You don't know when that sort of last cutoff point was where the last of it sort of left because then you have no way to measure it or reference it past that. But this does make a very good way of dating things that are somewhat old, right? Now, if we're talking about the grand scope of the Earth, uh, this is fairly young, but it certainly goes back a lot further than, let's say, uh, when we were coming into the agricultural age and things of that. So some of the initial artifacts that could be made out of wood or something like that, this is certainly an accurate choice for that, uh, depending on how far back you're going. So 50,000 years is about the cutoff there. So then one of the questions that will inevitably come up is, well, how do we deal with something that is older than 50,000 years, right? So we talk about things like dinosaur bones, which is usually the go-to example. Everybody wants to talk about dinosaur fossils. So how do we know? Well, there's different ways of dating. Some of it can be how deeply buried they are. If it's in a certain location that has a reliable amount of sediment that's settling on top, especially in areas that have volcanoes. Okay, but one of the other ways that we can do that is by looking at other isotopes. So carbon-14 is just one isotope of a set. There are other isotopes of different elements that exist out there in nature, and they have much more impressive half-lives in terms of how long they can last out there. Okay, so for instance, uranium-235 is a well-documented isotope, and it will decay, as much of uranium's isotopes do, into lead. Okay? And lead has a tendency, when you start going above lead, many of the, uh, it's lead 207, many of the isotopes that are above lead will start decaying back towards lead. Lead is one of the last stable elements as far as its nucleus is concerned before they start getting so heavy that they will slowly over time start decaying back down towards that area, okay? So uranium-235 to lead-207, this has a half-life of 700 million years. So now that blows something like 50,000 years completely out of the water in terms of the dating capability. Now, Uranium-235 is not always going to be present in every single dig site or artifact that you are uncovering, right? Uh, whereas carbon, if it's a living, uh, you know, something that is plant-based or a living organism, carbon you can pretty much always guarantee is going to be present there. But this is one technique, finding other isotopes, and this is just one example, that have longer half-lives and are able to be utilized in place of carbon, which doesn't have that scope or can't go that far back, okay? Now, another interesting note, because we're talking about limitations here, um, it's not so much a limitation, but a concern or something to think about. It is interesting to note that in the more recent decades, and even uh, you could say the more recent centuries, like the past two centuries, we have seen a change in the carbon-14 ratio content to carbon-12 ratio, and that is primarily due to coal emissions and the industrialization of the planet. So as we industrialized, as we produced more, as we had more coal burning and the need to generate power for these industrialized cities that came online, this obviously had emissions and it was spewing additional carbon material into the atmosphere. Okay, now one of the ways that carbon-14 is actually formed is that nitrogen-14, which is the stable form of nitrogen up in the atmosphere, is hit with high-level energy, primarily from the sun, okay? A neutron can bombard or blast into the nitrogen, and you will eject a proton out, and you will end up with carbon-14. So you get carbon-14, right, plus a proton that can be released. This is a form of, uh, you know, radiation that's hitting the nitrogen-14. Well, there, if there's a certain amount of carbon that's predicted in the atmosphere and that has gone up or risen due to coal emissions and industrialization, you obviously have a more or a, a larger supply of the uh, active carbon content that's up in the atmosphere there. And so there have been sort of 
tweaking or uh, changes to those ratios in more recent times because of that. So it may be a little more challenging for scientists in future generations if they're looking back on a time like ours to figure out exactly what those ratios are if they're changing more and they used to be more consistent when we're looking back in kind of the prior uh, 50,000 years. All right, guys, that is going to be it for the lecture today. So I hope you, that you enjoyed learning about the carbon dating and how it works. Remember to like the video if you found it informative. Feel free to share it if you think that it could help somebody or somebody might find it of interest. Subscribe for all of your learning needs and remember to head on over to chemcomplete.com. That is linked down below in the description box and you can show us some support over there. I've got plenty of useful walkthrough guides if you're in organic chemistry or you just want to learn something. And that's a great way to help support the channel as well. So thanks as always for choosing to learn with me and I will see you guys in the next one. I'm out of here.